And welcome to the Skeptic Zone, show number 42 for the 7th of August 2009. Richard Saunders here with you, getting over the dreaded skeptic flu once again on today's show. First up is an interview with Mythbuster and skeptic Adam Savage. Then we have an interview with Professor Leonie Rennie from Western Australia, and we hear her take on science communication and education. But before we start, a special announcement. The Australian Skeptics, via our patron Dick Smith, yesterday released an open letter in the Australian newspaper. You can see this letter by clicking the link at www.skepticzone.tv. This letter, aimed at parents of Australia, outlines our concerns with the antics of the Australian Vaccination Network, a group well known to listeners of the Skeptic Zone. We'll keep you updated as this story develops. But for now, sit back, have a nice glass of champagne, and enjoy this interview as Iran Sergev talks with Adam Savage. Adam Savage is a modeler, special effects expert, and co-host of the Mythbusters television show. Adam attended the Amazing Meeting 7 in Las Vegas, where I caught up with him to talk about his career, being a skeptic, and a lot more. Adam, welcome to the Skeptic Zone. Thank you. Uh, Can you tell us a little bit about what you have presented here at uh, TAM? I'm giving a talk on failure, basically, uh, in short. you hear a lot of people who uh, enjoy reasonable amount of success in their life talk about how important a factor failing was in that success, that they stumbled and uh, along their way. Um, but most interviews with people who are successful look like their lives are a linear path, uh, just straight up towards the success they currently enjoy. And I wanted to, I was thinking about it and I thought, I've never heard someone tell really un, unvarnished stories about screwing something up from start to finish. And so I came up with a couple of tales from my past of of episodes where I completely screwed something up. And, I mean, hurt people that I loved, lost friends, lost money. And uh, 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 I also, upon thinking about it, realized that that is actually what makes a good skeptic. Somebody who has stumbled and recovered, who has had their mind changed, or who realizes that they're fallible. I mean, dogmatism is nothing if not someone who believes that their opinion can't be shifted. Uh, and a skeptic is someone who, who realizes that it can. When you gave that talk, you defined yourself as a skeptic. And um, I'm just wondering whether that really is your definition of yourself, uh, or, or do, do you even have a definition of yourself, or do you find yourself in, in many different ways? That's a good question. Um, I started doing Mythbusters because somebody offered me a job in television, and it turned out to be a great job. Uh, It turned out to be a job that I was uniquely suited for, one that I loved, and one that I have a sense of ownership over that I would have never foreseen when I started doing it. Um, And in the course of doing Mythbusters, we didn't set out to make a show that was about critical thinking or skepticism. It just happened that way. So, no, it, I, you're right that I don't define myself as a skeptic, but I, I do recognize uh, all of the aspects of, of, of a true skeptic in my, in my personality and in the work that I do. And I think the movement itself is, uh, needs as much help as it can get. Absolutely, people should be, should, should be aware about uh, critical thinking and being skeptical towards fantastic claims. And, you know, I take that mission seriously. And uh, obviously, you've been told many times in the past, and you're obviously aware of it, that the show is highly skeptical and shows how science works and Mm -hmm. and critical thinking. But as far as I'm aware, there's never been any real discussion of that on the show. It just happens. Is is that correct? Yeah, well, I think that's actually quite scientific. I mean, we're not telling you that... See, I don't think you... When you start to look at... If you want to figure something out, the method by figuring it out turns out to be the scientific method. The scientific method is just a name for a natural way that humans learn. Um, 
which is to build each of your conclusions upon data that you've gathered in previous tests and, and move forward towards illuminating what you don't know. Um, and, uh, you know, Michael Shermer gave a talk this morning about the fact that, you know, everyone of a particular polit political bent believes that their politics are the truth and then everyone else is politicized. Yes. Um, but I do believe that when it comes to science, it's not a political stance to be scientific about something. It's not a political stance to be skeptical. Um, so, no, I don't think it requires talking about any more than it requires us to talk about being atheists on the show. I, I was talking, I, was, I think I was thinking more about formalizing the notion of critical thinking, mm. explaining about controls. And I'm, maybe I'll ask a, a more uh, specific question. Have you thought about doing perhaps a show or a videos, accompanying videos um, that would actually discuss the scientific method, be more educational, perhaps even be suited to specific curricula. Interesting. Um, actually, I often say that if we had set out to make a show that was really educational, we would have failed miserably. Oh. Yeah. Um, the fact is, we understand that we tell a story, and we understand that story has elements to it about illuminating concepts to people. But the show is really driven by the, Jamie's and my curiosity. And we take that mission really seriously. All the other stuff tends to be... Um, I, I do believe there's a great curriculum in Mythbusters. Uh, it's not something we have the time or the ability to do while we're filming 20-some-odd shows per year, 45 weeks a year, 10 hours a day, five days a week. Um, and there are, there, are some, there are some good books out there. There's thousands of science teachers all over the world talking every Thursday morning after our show airs with their students about the stuff that we're doing. Um, but we have we just don't have the ability to build that curriculum right now. Now, you mentioned the number of shows and how, how much hard work it is. Now, by last count, I think you've done 125 shows so well, far. Well, actually, it? yeah, we're currently filming, I think, 131, but and that doesn't take into account the 25... 30 some odd hours of specials that we've done. So we've done, I think, close to a hundred and close to a solid week, 168 hours, a solid week, 24 hours a day, seven days a week yeah. of Mythbusters. That's absolutely amazing. And how do you keep fresh after? I mean, it's been seven years or seven or eight years, and and all the, that many shows. How do you keep fresh? How do, how do you keep excited about it? Because you're, it's quite obvious in the shows that you are excited about yeah, it. Yeah, well, really it's, like it. I said, the sense of ownership is just increases every year. Uh, Jamie and I started out as hired talent uh, on a show that we all sort of figure out how to make at the same time. Um, and we are now, you know, effectively executive producers of this show. We, we have a huge hand in the content, in the content direction, in its explication and uh, uh, the the core team of Jamie, I, Jamie, uh, me, our director producer Alice Dallow, and our executive producer in Australia Dan Tapster, um, the the four of us care so deeply about this material and have so much fun with it. I mean, we argue constantly. Um, the right idea always wins out because it's really apparent to everyone once it shows up in the room, and uh, there's still plenty of material. I mean, we're we've got. You know, on our master list, something like 250 stories that we can still do. Is that major stories? Because you, you never That's, sure um, have, That uh, would be probably another 125 hours of Mythbuster. <laughs> okay. <laughs> My kids are very happy right now hearing this. <laughs> um, now, uh, in, all, in all those um, 168 hours of, of shows, what, what would you say was the most memorable adventure that you, you've had? It's, uh, it's, imp it's nearly impossible to say. I mean... Because we've done so many, I mean, 800 some odd different experiments, uh, and we're doing something different literally every five or six days. Um, the most recent really amazing thing was I got to fly in an FA-18 Hornet with the Blue Angels. I got to break the sound barrier seven or eight times. I got to pull seven and a half Gs, uh, which made me pass out and throw up, and it was totally intense and completely amazing. Um, there are aspects of doing the show that vary depending on the episode. I mean, there are episodes which I consider the science is, the, is, is totally the best that we've ever been able to achieve. Things like bullets fired up or the penny from the Empire State Building uh, or swimming in syrup. Uh, there are episodes where I feel like the, the, the narrative itself is really thrilling and those are episodes like uh, Confederate Rocket or Alcatraz Escape. 
Uh, and then there are episodes which I just consider the best description of how much fun the process is, and that's Lead Balloon. That's my all-time favorite episode. Okay. It's building a floating 14-foot diameter balloon out of uh, 14 kilos of lead. It's yeah. totally thrilling. <laughs> it was an amazing show. Um, now, you personally subject yourself to all kinds of experiments. Um, you almost drown, and you, um, you uh, sit in a chair and, and have drops of water dripping on your forehead. I was just wondering whether in all of those experiments and experiences, where have you, you've ever been really, really scared? Um, I have been. I have been. Um, I actually, I didn't nearly drown. In the underwater car episode, I was quite confident under the water. I can hold my breath for almost two minutes. Um, the standing on the deck of the Mythtanic, which was a 28-ton steel boat waiting for it to sink and not knowing if it would suck me down when it went down, was probably one of the scariest moments on the show. Um, that was one where we really didn't know what was going to happen. We had safety divers, we had paramedics and everything, but we really didn't know, and that was spooky. Um, for the most part, at this point, I, I volunteer for everything that I do. I want to do it. I've wanted to try it. Uh, I wanted to sit in the car while it sank in the water. I wanted to know what that was like. It was awesome. Um, I want to, you know, I, I want to be my own action hero, and the show lets me try that out. On that, I have to ask: Did um, Grant actually volunteer to smell your shoes? Or your feet? Or, <laughs> yes. Or was he forced to do it? I, you know, I can't speak for the other guys. I, he might have been forced. Okay. Um, now, um, you've ob you obviously have to be very inventive in the way you, you perform those experiments. You have to build all kinds of rigs and, and um, uh, invent a lot of stuff. But I'm interested to know whether you've ever invented something that is actually a real invention, as in patentable. I'm, I'm sure it's possible. Um, I know that we've done things in ways that I have never seen before. Uh, when I built the, the differential wind tunnel for uh, the penny from the Empire State Building will kill you myth, um, I had never seen a demonstration of a wind tunnel that had one speed at the bottom and a different speed at the top on the theory that the penny, would ha which has two different terminal velocities, would tumble up and down within that tube. And it did. And that was really thrilling to see that demonstration. That was actually an early turning point for me in learning what my job was on the show, was building a demonstration I thought was that elegant and lovely and without any, without any guidebook or marker to, to, to work off of. That gave me a lot of confidence. Okay. Now, uh, your Moon Landing hoax episode is my, one of my personal favorites uh, for obvious reasons. Um, do you plan to tackle any other conspiracy theories? Um, absolutely. They're on our list. There's a, we have a whole other hour of Moon Landing conspiracy theories. Um, the Kennedy assassination is one that shows up from time to time, although the material is so grim that Discovery, which is a family network, you know, has a problem if we are going to start showing the Zapruder film on prime yeah. time on advertising supported cable. Um, absolutely. For the most part, uh, you know, people ask about testing the World Trade Center as a conspiracy theory. And the problem we have with that is we know that we're not going to change anybody's mind unless we went full size, and that's just not feasible. Yes. Um, so we stay away from things where we recognize the test is, test is going to not demonstrate. It's very hard to scale building materials. It's very hard to scale materials and their behavioral characteristics. Uh, and that would make trying to come up with a definitive answer on that test a losing proposition, very likely. And being uh, explosion um, prone to explosions, you'd be blamed for exactly. doing something. Exactly. Anyway, so. <laughs> for faking it, yeah. yes. Um, now, in the past, I remember I heard you in an interview somewhere mentioning that uh, you would like to uh, bust the myth that evolution is not true. Right. And I was just Actually, wondering... I'm glad you phrased it that way. Yeah, I know, because you phrased it incorrectly yes. then. Um, I, I do remember that, yes. actually. But maybe it was on the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. So, yeah, it's, yeah. And it's, that, it's been corrected on my Wikipedia page. <laughs> yeah. Thank goodness. Um, but um, I'm just wondering whether you've um, made any steps in that direction, and um, um, do, do you have any thoughts about how it might be done? No. I, I, unfortunately, I think there's, we're, in this, we're in this zone where... where demonstrating evolution, demonstrating natural selection is just very likely too exhaustively boring for the format of our particular show. Um, and to be quite honest, uh, 
it's not going, no demonstration we did of that is actually going to satisfy young earthers, who was actually who I was talking about when I was first saying that. I was thinking, oh, you prove natural selection, you get rid of the young earthers. But no, actually, young earthers who believe the world is 6,000 years old actually do believe in a form of super high speed evolution. That Noah somehow had one dog that grew in the last 6,000 years to you know, 27,000 different breeds or something like that. Um, so... I think we're going to have to leave that one for a different format of a show. Yeah, I think uh, Richard Lensky. Have you heard of the Lensky experiment with the E. coli? No. He's actually oh, yes, shown. I have. Lab. I have. But it's taken hundreds, 20 years. I'm not sure you have that long. What's that? It's taken about 20 years yes. of meticulously collecting material and sampling and freezing. Yeah. And his data is beautiful. beautiful. It's absolutely amazing because yeah. it has actually evolution in a lab reproducible because he can go back to any generation he wants. Yes. And it, it's fantastic. It's astonishing. Yeah. The work is incredible. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, not sure he would work. make very good television, though. <laughs> uh, um, have you ever done a Myth, Mythbusters show or something like it on stage? Um, no, people ask us to do that. The problem is we are not a demonstration show. We're an experimental show. Yes. So uh, the stuff that people would do on stage is a demonstration of a scientific concept, and that totally doesn't interest us at all. We, don't, we understand that we may, like we did slipping on a banana peel recently, and if you're going to investigate slipping on a banana peel, you have to look at the difference between static and dynamic friction. Uh, there are two different forces, and both come into play on slipping on a banana peel. So when I looked at, when I started talking to a, 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 a structure, a, a, an engineer about that, I was like, that's great. Okay, so we should do some tests that demonstrate the difference between static and dynamic friction and coefficients of friction and overcoming them, et cetera. Um, but again, that's only to illustrate this, to get to the end of this story and figure out about banana peels. I don't really care about doing a demonstration on stage about the difference between static and dynamic friction. I don't think anyone else would want to watch it either. Really, I think when people say they'd love us to do something on stage, they mean they want us to blow something up. And that's <laughs> never going to happen. So for the most part, people are kind of shit out of luck when it comes to us doing myth busting on stage. I did have an idea recently. We got asked to do an appearance for 25,000 people, and I did want to... I still might want to try this in some kind of venue, just to get everyone in the stadium to jump up at the same moment and see how far away we can read the resulting bump on uh, Richter scales. That'd be interesting. Well, um, from, we are from Australian Skeptics, and we have a big convention at the end of 2010, and your production company is obviously Australian. In fact, I go past their offices every morning Beyond on my way to work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we were thinking of that it would be great if you could come to Australia and do something on stage. For I would lo- well, okay, I can guarantee you we're not going to do something on stage, <laughs> but we've always wanted to get down under. We never even visited the home offices of our own production company. Uh, and we know that there's at least a good two hours in Australian myths. We'll definitely be in touch, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, do something about bringing you Absolutely. to Australia. Absolutely, yeah. Even, uh, even just as guests, guests in our You know what uh, I want to do is I want to actually demonstrate how difficult it is to view the Coriolis force difference between b- above the equator and below the equator. That Australia is perfectly step. situated at the, about the, roughly the same latitude as San Francisco. Yeah. Uh, Sydney is, I think. 33 uh, south. What's south. that? 33 south. Right. So it's about the same. And... Uh, I, we could absolutely demonstrate that the Coriolis force is real and that it does make things spin in opposite directions from my understanding of the science. However, it takes three or four days after pouring the water into a vessel to let the vessel settle, get rid of everything but the brownie in motion, and then to cleanly pull a plug. It's, it's very complicated. I'm really looking forward to doing it. Yeah, I've actually done a um, demonstration video with a, with a rubber ducky once oh, for, yeah? for a science show in Israel. For, <laughs> so oh, that's great. <laughs> it was very easy to make it go whichever way I wanted it yeah, to go. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Of course, all you have to do is stir the water a little bit, and that's it. Yes. Now, um, uh, a personal question, perhaps. Um, you've, you've been known to use Twitter to avoid paying... Um, <laughs> I didn't uh, use it to avoid paying a $15,000 phone bill. I use it to achieve what is right. Now, the phone companies are still getting away with charging one to three cents per kilobyte just because no one's looking. And people don't understand the difference between a kilobyte and a kilobit and an email and how much data is actually there. And while no one quite understands that, the phone company is robbing people. Yeah. So I absolutely, I pay attention to the social networking sites. I read Gizmodo, Boing Boing Fark, Reddit, all those sites every day. I know the stories that have come up of people getting exorbitant phone bills for crossing a national border while they were downloading a movie on their phone or something like that. I knew it would be a good story. 
And uh, I tweeted with full knowledge that I would hopefully guilt the phone company into granting uh, a reprieve from the cost, and they did almost immediately. <laughs> That's very nice of them. Would fame alone not have achieved that? Um, you know what? They claim not, and I do know, I, I've gotten plenty of emails from people saying, you know, they're not famous, they don't have a crapload of Twitter followers, and they got the phone company to wipe the costs. And honestly, I've had big international bills before that I've called up the phone company and said, can you backdate me to an international plan and charge me what I would have been paying? And they've always agreed to do that. Yeah. Phone companies don't want to screw you. But in this, I mean, their first offer was, well, we can reduce it from 15000 to 4000 And I'm like, you're insane. I surfed the web for two and a half hours. Yeah. There is no, the space shuttle pays one hundredth of that to receive data from NASA. You, you're, you're on crack if you think I'm going to pay it. And I'll use every bit of my fame to make sure that you guys are guilted into releasing me from this obligation. To their credit, they were incredibly nice. They called me almost immediately, and they've been super gracious the whole time I've been dealing with them. That's very good, but it, it, it does show something about the power of the social networks, and we're also seeing it in the skeptical absolutely, movement. In absolutely, terms of, that's how the message gets out. And bringing in younger people into the fold, because it's so easy to now to make the contact and to be, become part of something. So that's really yeah. great. Um, now... Um, uh, my children asked, uh, asked me to ask a couple of questions. They're actually good questions, so I'm happy to, uh, to quote them. What's the weirdest job you've ever had? Hmm. I've had a lot of weird jobs. I've seemed to have ended up spending an inordinate amount of time in my early 20s working, working with and around drag queens. Okay. Um, I, I was worked for a year as a projectionist at the 8th Street Playhouse in New York where the Rocky Horror Picture Show fad began. Um, I spent uh, six months running lights for a drag queen version of Whatever Happened to Baby Jane in San Francisco, which was a legendary production that was just sick and wrong and beautiful and amazing. Um, and I spent two and a half years working for a really uh, renowned drag, not all drag, uh, sort of camp comedy review in San Francisco called Beach Blanket Babylon. And uh, those three absolutely take the cake. <laughs> yeah, they, they sound like they do. And the last question is, uh, uh, do you ever feel sorry for Basta? Um, no, actually, Buster is a terrific <laughs> release for any aggression that I might have on any given day. And throwing him face first out of the back of the truck is just as satisfying as you imagine that it is. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Adam. Thanks You're for welcome. being on the Skeptic Zone. Thank you. And now a message from the inside of Richard Saunders' walk in refrigerator. Thank you to everybody who came up to see me at the amazing meeting. And thank you for those who bought my origami earrings. I've set up a little store at skepticzone.etsy.com. It all goes to helping the Skeptic Zone podcast. You're listening to The Skeptic Zone. I'm Brian Dunning from Skeptoid.com. I'm Carly Sturgis, and I'm certain that we all wonder if science education is really something that only happens in schools. How do children best learn science? What is learning anyway? And what will happen to Australia when we get a national curriculum? Today's interview is with Professor Leonie Rennie. She is a Professor of Science and Technology Studies, is the former Dean of Graduate Studies, and currently a Research Professor at the Department of Research and Development at the Curtin University of Technology in Western Australia. She has written extensively on the community's contribution to science learning and the impact of the public understanding of science. Professor Rennie also contributed as a co-author to the Australian School Science Education National Action Plan for 2008 to 2012, with the aim of achieving agreement about priority actions to be pursued through national collaborative efforts. Professor Rennie's work on the learning of science in formal and informal contexts has greatly informed science communication, which is why I'll be starting my interview by asking, what is science communication anyway? I'm here at Curtin University with Professor Leonie Rennie, and it's lovely to meet you, Leonie. Hello, Kylie. <laughs> okay, what is science communication? I am talking to someone who is a major force for science communication in Australia. What on earth does that mean? I mean, science communication. I, uh, science communication is generally held to be the communication of science to people who aren't scientists. Ah. 
um, and usually adults because if they're in school then it's called science education probably. Mm -hmm. um, so science communication is a, I think we could probably say it, it's almost its own discipline now mm -hmm. um, and it, it relates to the, it really has to be a way of changing science as the scientists see it into a form that is understandable to the general public. And in the past, um, the unfortunate acronym of PUS, which stood for Public Understanding of Science, huh. um, which sort of came to the fore in probably the 1980s, um, was, or it has been slated as being a somewhat deficit approach in the idea that the public are pretty dumb, they don't know much. So if we give them lots of science stuff, then they'll become mm. scientifically literate or whatever, and we're communicating our science. So this kind of top-down approach is pretty well out the window now, I think. Oh. And I think it's fair to say that a significant change was facilitated by the um, BSE, um, the bovine... Uh, it's well, I, Yeah, the, that's the one, sponge... Yes. Yeah, whatever. Spongy form where the yep, brain gets a dreadful disease. Yeah. Exactly. The mad cow disease mm. um, was so badly handled in oh. England in terms of communicating information about it to the public that there is movement amongst the parliament and so on. A lot of surveys and so on, parliamentary statements in England. And it, there's now recognition that it's not so much telling the public, but it's actually engaging the public in more of a two-way dialogue between the scientists and between the public, recognising that the public is not a homogeneous body, but in fact a very heterogeneous body with people with varying interests and understandings about science. Um, so that's rather a long explanation, I think. <laughs> and it's become a discipline, as something that people study at university, in fact. There are a very large number of oh. science communication courses, quite a few in Australia. There's a new one just starting up at... Uh, UWA, I think there's probably the one, the most prestigious one is the one at the um, at ANU, at Australian National University, which comes out of the Centre for Public Awareness of Science, and the director of that centre, Sue Stockelmeyer, would, in my view, be one of the leading science communicators in Australia. So, does one have to have a degree in science communication to become a science communicator? Is it that sort of strict in terms of defining it? No, I would not think so. Yeah. I think that people who can communicate science don't necessarily call themselves science communicators. They're just passionate about their subject and they can communicate it. Mm. Um, there are a lot of scientists who are not good science communicators because they somehow aren't able to make what it is they're saying intelligible and understanding to the, to the uh, public to whom they're speaking. And Sue Stockelmeyer and her colleagues, Mike Gore in particular, who you may recall was the founder of, of Questacon, Australia's National Science and Technology Centre, do a lot of work, both in Australia and internationally, um, promulgating ways for scientists to learn to communicate better. And they see that, they being the scientists, see that as beneficial because if people can't understand what they're doing, they feel as if they're more likely to get public support for what it is they're doing. So what are the keys to communicating science well? What are some of the big lessons that these people learn? I think it's recognition of where the audience to whom you wish to communicate, where they're at, mm. and then preparing or changing what it is you've prepared, in fact, so that it's understandable yeah. by that particular audience. And I, that, I mean, that's the essence of any sort of communication. Science communication is just something to do with the content that you're trying to communicate. Mm. So learning is one of the big factors within it. How do we learn? What sort of things do we know influence us learning well? And I, I imagine science communicators must want to tap into that. Yes. Learning's not easy to define. No, I I've, I've noticed that as an educator myself for 10 <laughs> yeah. years. I think I get a different PD all the time about, oh, this is going to be the way to do it. And it's like, yeah. next week it'll be, oh, we come up with something new. So yeah. what do we know? Well, I think the, the, the bottom line is that people learn differently. Yeah. I mean, I like looking at graphs and tables and mathematical representations of what it is I'm learning. Other people like to have pictures. Mm. Um, other people like to just read words. So 
that's and some people like to hear things some people like to see things so there's a whole way of taking in the information that one has to learn mm -hmm. um, I think the three important things about learning firstly is that it's a it's a unique personal process yeah. that it's cumulative so what anything that you anything you learn that's new will usually build upon what you already know and it could change it or just add to it and the third thing is that learning takes time yeah. and so one of the criticisms of people saying that science centres for example and museums are places of learning is that well you know how can they learn anything they're only there for an hour or two hours and the thing is that in that hour or two hour they could have a an enlightened moment mm. um, where they see something that fits into other stuff that they knew before or somewhere down the track mm. they could have an experience that harks back to what they did there's an experience in a science centre or a museum and say oh yeah now I get it sort of their their personal epiphany if mm. you like for whatever it is that they've just learned this is in fact something that you've done research on and, and written about the importance of science museums and I have, yes, I've done a fair bit um, in that area and I think that science museums and, and museums and a whole range of out-of-school mm. um, experiences have got the potential to teach people a lot about science. And in fact, when you think that even for a school child, the percentage of time that they actually spend in school mm. is much less than half of their lifetime even if you take out the, the sleeping hours. And of all that time they spend in school, only a small portion of it's going to be devoted to science. So a lot of science learning is going to be happening outside of school anyway, even for school children. And teachers need to be aware of what kids are coming in with, what knowledge they've got, which can be wrong, it can be right, it can be ill-formed, can be very resistant to change. Mm. Um, teachers have to work with that and help students to move into a more scientifically acceptable way of thinking, I think, if they want to progress and, and learn the sort of science that scientists deal with. Yeah. There's a variety of other programs too, which are mums in science and scientists in schools as well, I believe, which mm. is bringing yes. the science to the classroom. Yes, scientists in schools is an interesting program, mm. but you mentioned mums in science first. Yeah. I think the ANU through... CPAS, the Centre for Public Awareness of Science, had a very successful program last year, which I think the main benefit was letting mums come and actually do stuff yeah. and giving them the confidence that they could actually know and understand and do this. And so they could talk to their kids about the science they did at school. So I think the, the empower, empowering aspect of the mums in science was just giving them the confidence. Mm. And there's no reason why it couldn't be dads in science too. It's just that the hours yeah. <laughs> the hours sort of suited the mums who, yeah. who could come with their little, really mm. little kids and so on, and then talk to their, their children from school. Mm. Scientists in schools, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of scientists in schools program around the world. They're not all called that. But the one in Australia has been funded by the Department of Education, Employment and Workplace Relations and is run by the CSRO, the education branch. And at the moment they've got something like 1,300 partnerships wow. working in schools across Australia involving something in the order of 850 schools. Um, some of them are primary, some of them are secondary. And the way the partnerships between scientists and teachers work varies enormously, mm. really enormously. Some of the really successful ones have been where scientists have come in schools, worked with the teacher to prepare a program, and the scientists can lead the program, or the teacher can lead the program with a, a scientist backing up, as it were. And it's in those programs some of the outcomes are just very exciting the kids yes. get so enthusiastic I was visiting a school here in Perth um, last year in fact and the scientist had come into a year one class cool. uh, he was a soil scientist and he'd taken the kids over into the senior school to the science labs and they were using microscopes and so the kids there were a few parents helping all these little one kids were looking at onion skin under the microscope oh, and then they got wonderful. some euglena yes. you know euglena those little tiny single cell green mm. animals in ponds and I was just sitting there taking my field notes and 
All of a sudden, a little boy jumped up and he ran around the room shouting, I saw one swimming, I saw one swimming. <laughs> and it was just so amazing because yeah. these little Euglini, you could see them moving around yeah. under the microscope. Yeah, so yeah. I think, you know, whether there's long-term learning uh, is, is one thing, but um, I think the main thing is that the enthusiasm. There, there are two things, the enthusiasm the kids get out of it, mm. but also the enthusiasm the scientists get out of it. A lot yes. of them have said... Well, it's kind of renewed my passion, you know. Um, and we've demonstrated, um, my colleague Christine Howard and I, who've been evaluating that program, um, have demonstrated quite conclusively that there's an, or- an enormous boost in confidence in teaching science for primary teachers who archetypically um, have not had much science in their own education and feel quite unconfident about teaching science at school. So I think part of it is not just learning whatever it is that the scientist happens to be an expert in, but having the confidence to realise that you don't have to know anything. But if you can get the kids to ask their own questions and investigate them, that the teachers can be learning along with the, the kids. And the scientists there to provide that expert advice and be that kind of support, if you like, with the teachers. So it's been a, a very successful program and it's still continuing, I might add. It's still going on. Mm. You're involved with the National Action Plan for Australian Schools Science Education. What's going to be happening to Australia in the future? <laughs> uh, good point. Um, my colleague Dennis Goodrum, who was then at the University of Canberra, and I prepared that report in 2007 mm. for the government. We were trying to look at future directions for science education in Australia. Um, Australia, like most Western countries, is suffering from an a insufficient workforce in science, yeah. engineering, technology related careers. There's, particularly at the lower secondary level, a high level of disengagement among students in science at school. Why is that? What's turning kids off? Well, I don't think it would be much of a stretch to say that much of the science that they learn at that level is actually quite boring and irrelevant in their eyes. Mm. It doesn't seem to relate much to what they do outside of school. Mm. Now, I have to categorise this and say this is not every classroom. No. But generally accepted across and there's been a lot of reports in Europe, the US, about this, is that it's seen, the science that they get in school is seen to be based on the science disciplines, the concepts, which are actually very difficult to apply in out-of-school situations. And there are a number of reasons for that, not the least of which that science outside of school is actually quite interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary. There isn't just one explanation for things like global warming or salinity or whatever, whereas the science they learn at school tends to be physics or chemistry or biology. And it's very hard to... I mean, if you just take Newton's second law, F equals mm. MA, um, it's very helpful for solving problems in your physics textbook, but it's actually not terribly useful to figuring out what happens outside when you're driving a car and I always think of a year eight student I met many years ago when I was collecting some data at a school and uh, he asked you know why don't we do more interesting science at school I said well what do you want to do when you grow up and he said he wanted to be a racing car driver I said well what's the science topic you're doing at the moment and he said forces and energy but he could see no connection can no connection between the two. Oh. So there's got to be a way of linking what science out there in the real world with science that happens in school. And so I'm a big advocate of more community involvement in science, which is why I'm a supporter of the Scientist in Schools program, um, because it seems to be having those kinds of positive effects. What do you think might happen to Australia's science education program? We have the national curriculum Yes. On our doorstep, for example. Yes. Um, the national curriculum is an interesting outcome. The national action plan, which you mentioned earlier, one of... I mean, we, we looked at things concerning students and the science curriculum, things pertaining teachers, teacher education, supply and demand of teaching of teachers, and we also looked at the systems of, you know, the jurisdictions, the state systems, the, you know, government, religious, independent school systems and the community as a whole and how they could better interact. One of the things that we felt was not especially useful was the fact that every state and territory has its own education system. 
and they have their own curriculum although there's a great deal of commonality if you look between them and it just didn't seem that everyone should be reinventing or inventing their own wheel and and so on and so we had suggested that a more national approach to curriculum was appropriate and we'd Dennis and another colleague, Mark Hackling, and I had in an earlier report called The Status and Quality of Teaching and Learning Science in Australian Schools, which was published in 2001, had said virtually the same thing. And so now that we are having a national curriculum in a number of subjects, and science is one of the first ones off the rank, as it were, um, the... uh, there was an extensive period of consultation and then writing began earlier this year and there will be, my understanding is, um, a round of communication with stakeholders during August of some preliminary documentation, sort of scope and sequence kind of information. Whether or not it's accepted across all of the states will be a political decision, mm-hmm. not a decision related specifically to science education I think. So the writing team and the advisory committee for not just science but for all of the subjects that are currently being prepared have representatives from each state and territory that way I guess there's a bit of ownership because people come from their own systems knowing what their own curriculum is like so it'll be interesting to see what the uptake is. There will certainly be lots of public consultation the the August, my understanding is that the August consultations will be generally with stake, key stakeholders um, looking at preliminary documentations before there's a further iteration and then it goes out for more public scrutiny later so the the um, the implementation would not be expected to begin before 2011. Interesting times that we've got ahead of us. Then. Indeed, indeed. Yes. <laughs> so looking forward to more science communication in the meantime. Keep on pushing the message. Yes, yeah, I think so. I think so. Thank you very much, Professor Leo. No problem. Thanks, Carly. This is Grizzly from the Grizzly's Growls podcast at grizzliesgrowls.com, and you're listening to The Skeptic Zone. And so am I. But hey, don't take my word for it. Ah, oh, come on. That was funny. Skeptic, don't take my word. Oh, never mind. Thank you for downloading this episode of The Skeptic Zone. And thanks to everybody who wrote in offering their help in transcribing some of our interviews. We have enough people for now, and the project is well underway. On next week's show, we'll talk to musician and podcaster George Rabb, report on our trip to Perth, and Dr. Rachie will be back with Dr. Rachie Reports, and of course, the Think Tank. Until then, this is Richard Saunders, Signing off from Sydney, Australia. You've been listening to The Skeptic Zone. Visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for comments, contacts and extra video reports. The Skeptic Zone,